Now, this event was going to be two weeks of a guided tour of Newfoundland, camping or motelling, like I said, in a different location each night. What a great way to see a province. Good day, and welcome to Yeah, It's Red. My name is Robert, and I'm a Honda ST1100 enthusiast. I'm currently working on a series on my Newfoundland trip that I took in the summer of 2022. And how this started, well, uh, it started with a posting by Jim Gow in the ST Owners Forum, and he operates a YouTube channel called Old Guy on a Bike. So um, I'll probably post a link down below. Anyway, he posted something back in October 2021. And uh, the idea was he's planning the first stock on the rock. And it's a two weeks of semi-guided riding in Newfoundland. The start date is July 18th, 2022. So we had a lot of advance notice. And it was called the Rolling Rock Stock. The Honda ST community holds stock events and, uh, all across North America. And it's usually a three-day event and it's organized by a member of the community. And it uh, features an area of the state or province that has a lot of back roads, twisty roads, elevation and beautiful scenery. And you're there for about three days. And there's a base camp. It could be a campground, a motel or a hotel. And from there, you get to explore what the area has to offer. It's a great time, good friends, and great riding. Now, this event was going to be two weeks of a guided tour of Newfoundland, camping or motelling, like I said, in a different location each night. And what a great way to see a province. Now, Jim worked it out so that if you weren't able to do the full two weeks, there was a 10-day option, and a one-week option as well. So since October of 2021, and over the course of time until we started, uh, Jim plotted out an itinerary of campgrounds, motels, B&Bs, and all the accommodation options that there were to be had on this trip. Now, the province was also uh, trying to revive their economy and having a tourism campaign, so back to the rock. And uh, you had to book early if you wanted to participate in this, otherwise things were just uh, being snapped up. I loved the idea and was one of the first to jump on board. The camping part was what would make this affordable for me. And, well, as you all know, we had COVID and I work in the theater industry, I'm an opera stage manager, and my industry was greatly affected, so we, I wasn't earning any income for the past couple of years. So my funds were limited, and I needed to make a budget. Now I created a spreadsheet to calculate my costs, and fuel was a number one issue as prices were rising fast. And uh, it started off that I could average my price to about $1.40 a liter. And then at one point, my planning, when I kept checking, uh, it was over $2, like two twenty dollars in Newfoundland. Later, the government of Newfoundland stepped in and managed to get the price down to $2 a liter. Now, where I live and getting to the rock and round trip, I was going to cover around 9,000 kilometers. Now, I have an app on my phone to calculate my fuel consumption, so every time I fill up, I put in my mileage and I would get an idea. So I was averaging about 50, 54 miles to the imperial gallon. And then I further broke down this trip uh, to how many kilometers in each province I would travel. And I have another app uh, called Gas Buddy. And with that, I can uh, type in a location and it'll come up with fuel stations and the prices there. So I could 
get a better idea of what it was going to cost me to ride in each province and then what my total fuel costs would be. Since I started the spreadsheet and to when I actually went, my costs were going to go up about $150 in fuel. So it wasn't as bad as I thought for that price range from $1.40 to $2. It only meant $150 more in the total scheme of things. Now, given that this trip was in the realm of 10,000 kilometers, it was best that I have a fresh set of tires for the, you know, to have peace of mind and that I do an oil change prior to leaving. So I had to include that in the budget. Uh, to make my life simpler for future travel trips, I had a spare set of rims, but they needed to get in shape. So uh, a friend of mine painted them for me to get them ready. Um, I have an ABS-2 model, so my disc brake rotor discs are different sizes and I wanted to have just a complete unit to swap out from one bike, to, uh, one rim to the other without having to remove rotors uh, when I did that process. I was able to acquire the front ones and that was good, but the rear one just wasn't available and wasn't available for Honda, so I had to go to eBay and get one out. Uh, one of theirs uh, from China. Uh, that was okay, it fit, everything was good, but what it didn't have was the countersink uh, holes for where you mount the, the disc onto the rim. And those counter holes are important to me because that's where I put my magnets for my cruise control. So I didn't have time to countersink them, so I did in the end have to switch the rotor off of one rim and put it on the other one when I when it came time to do this trip. As I mentioned before, I chose to camp and Jim had given us costs for the campgrounds and some were federal and some were provincial and others were private. And so passes were required for the federal as well as the provincial. So I ordered those online and I ended up sharing a motel room over the course of the trip four times and so my camping costs were around $260 with the passes for that period of time and $300 for the motel and then we had the uh, the ferry so that was a bit of a hit because um, the ferry crossings you had to pay for your motorcycle there was a passenger fee you could choose to book a reclining chair or you could book a cabin. Uh, so the cabin fees are kind of optional, but in the end, uh, for other reasons, I chose to book a cabin. So I shared that with another rider and I had to pay another $200 for that luxury. So for meals, I budgeted around $70 a day. And that based that on what it would cost me to go out to a restaurant. Uh, so I just had a bit of headroom on, on that. And if, it also allowed me to stop at a Tim Hortons for a snack uh, and then have enough money for the, the larger events of a, a seafood dinner, uh, lobster fest, whatever. And they were just great. You can't go to Newfoundland without eating seafood. You, know, you just gotta. So, Adding all those things up, my total costs uh, for the two weeks camping in Newfoundland and my trip there and back, uh, including my tires and uh, oil change, ended up costing me about $3,500. What's not included in that is some extra things that I purchased over time just to replace some camping gear was a, a dry bag cooler uh, from Amazon. That was $75. Um, I'll go into more detail in a bit and a tarp from Amazon, that was $60. And then uh, the rear rotor, and that was about $110 for that. So uh, next, I plotted out the routes to get to Newfoundland. I live west of Toronto, and the most efficient way is to take the 400 series highways. And that would get me into Quebec and then 
there are also some super highways in Quebec and New Brunswick and whatnot. But I'm not a fan of these. I prefer the back roads, two lane highways, especially when riding a motorcycle. And navigating through that basket weave in Toronto and the potential of getting stuck in Milton for a period of time really didn't uh, humor me that much on that. And also I could bypass it by taking a, what we call the 407 and it's a toll road, but that's a $45 hit from one end to the other if I was to take that. So instead, I plotted a route uh, north of Toronto. So from where I am, I went up to Arthur and then I crossed over to Newmarket. From Newmarket, I wound my way to Peterborough and then more back roads up further east to Hawkesbury, which in Ontario, uh, which is a border crossing between provinces and uh, between province of Ontario and Quebec. And that kept me north of Montreal. And from there, I went to Trois-Rivières. So that was roughly 900 kilometers. So you, know, you worked out the math. Uh, if you're traveling 100 kilometers an hour, most of the roads that I was on were 80 to 90 kilometers. Um, that's an easy 10 hour trip. But we, we left at 8.30 in the morning and we got there at 9.30 at night in Trois Rivière. For the second day, I uh, decided to also follow the, the north side of the St. Lawrence, then crossing into Quebec City. And then we took the back roads into New Brunswick. And with the end goal being in Port Elgin in New Brunswick, that's where we had a campground but that uh, campground was closed, so we ended up in Sackville that day, that, that evening. And that was another 900 kilometer day. We had a few instances on that day too, if you recall in that video, uh, Dave had a problem with one of his driving lamps and then he lost a fender. Art, when we were going on the uh, Plaster Rock Road, which was 109 kilometers of no service, um, he hit a pothole and uh, lost air in his tire and bent his rims. So that set us back. So we didn't get into Zachville until 11 o'clock at night that night. Now, we go down to the third day. And the third day was to get to the Cabot Trail. Because online, a group of us had said, well, if we meet on the Sunday uh, in the morning, we could do the Cabot Trail during the day. And that would give us enough time to do that and then head back to North Sydney uh, that evening to catch the midnight crossing to Port of Basque. So I went from Sackville to Bedeck, then the next morning I did the, the run up the Cabot Trail and there. So that all in all was 700 kilometers for those two days. So that went well. I began planning from the get go. And over the past six years, I've been refining my camping gear, so that wasn't a real issue. Though I did do some test runs, I went out to some local campgrounds in the area and tried to see what I could refine and if I had to replace anything. Uh, now when the, the weather was warm, uh, I decided to go to some campgrounds in the area. So I'm, I'm currently working on some of that uh, video now which I will insert in, in there. So I'm, I'm camping, whatever. So that, I did that, uh, a few short trips, do, went to the campgrounds and, uh, and then I was trying to work out what my gear I was gonna use, streamline my pack, because I had quite a few things that I brought, a couple of mess kits, etc. so I narrowed it down to what I was going to take. My hammock is a complete unit. It has netting, mosquito netting. It also has a fly to protect me from the elements. It's not that big. It's, it just covers the hammock. So I opted to uh, acquire another tarp and it was uh, a three meter by 3.5 meter. I got it off of Amazon and with uh, trekking poles, uh, you'll see it on a video in a moment here. Um, I was able to create a larger covering so I'd have more real estate underneath uh, 
to be if it was inclement weather. I could set up my table and chair and my mess kit and cook underneath that if I wanted to. I had a couple of ways of setting it up. One was a sort of like a salt, salt box type of setup. And then the other was actually a true gable. And uh, so what the bonus for that, or the benefit from that, was that if it rained overnight, my hammock was dry, so was my fly, and the gear hammock and all the things underneath it. So I could pack those, if it was still raining, underneath that tarp, keep majority of my things dry while I'm packing up, and then shake off all the excess water that I could on that new tarp, and then pack it away in its own bag and keep them separate. So that was the plan, and actually that proved to be a good solution many a time on the trip to Newfoundland, because it did rain a, a few nights, and I was able to keep most of my gear dry. I'm going to end this video now. And we'll continue in the next episode with more of the logistics in terms of the gear that I brought and clothing that I wore. And then we will begin the first day on Newfoundland. Thanks for watching. If, <laughs> sorry, Mike, if you're watching. Uh, <laughs> so he loaned me this walk from Mountain Equipment Co-op is where he got it from.